Hello, it's Sarah. This is Hardcover Hearts in a very belated week of reading wrap up. Uh, this is actually going to be almost like two, two and a half weeks of reading that I'm going to be wrapping up for you. Uh, apologies for not getting anything up. I tried. Uh, there were uh, some technical glitches. Uh, I had neighbors upstairs that were moving out and it was incredibly loud. Uh, the weather was not working for me. Living in the Bay Area, this is our foggy season. And so the light uh, coming in is only really good at certain certain parts, which is definitely doesn't work with my work schedule. Uh, I like to film in the morning when the sun is kind of streaming in, but that's not, it uh, doesn't work when you're literally in a fog bank. But here we are. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, let me get started so we can kind of talk about some books because that's what you're here for, I'm sure. Uh, the first thing that I completed was the next in the um uh, Captain Sam Wyndham series. And this is Smoke and Ashes by Abir Mukherjee. I'm going to try to avoid the library copy glare there. Uh, Smoke and Ashes was a continuation of the series. I am absolutely in love with this series. It's historical fiction set in colonial uh, India. And we have Sam Wyndham, who is a gentleman who was in the, the first war and he's carrying a lot of demons, including uh, nursing a broken heart after the death of his wife. Uh, he, he asked for the post to be sent to India and he is in Calcutta. He's very clear eyed about the colonial challenge and what's happening and the dysfunction of British rule. And he's paired up with his junior, uh, who is a man named um, Surendra, and they call him Surrender Not. And Surrender Not comes from a very affluent, very well connected uh, Indian family. And uh, it creates interesting tension, gives an interesting perspective to the series. If you follow my channel, you know that I really care a lot that colonialism isn't continued to be glorified and, and, and heightened. And this series does a phenomenal job at really pointing out a lot of the hypocrisy, a lot of the insanity uh, that happens. At the same time, providing a very entertaining, very interesting characters and great stories. So in this one, this is set in 1921 in Calcutta, as I mentioned, and in order to quell Gandhi's kind of uh, what we call now nonviolent protests, but at that time was called non-cooperation, just love that, non-cooperation protests, uh, the Crown decided to send uh, Prince Edward to do a kind of tour of the colonies. And so it's around Christmas time and he is due to come in creates a ton of stress in the system because the police are there to try to keep everything calm, but at the same time, keep the prince protected. And there are some challenges to that, as you can only imagine. Uh, in along the lines, uh, there is a subplot uh, where Sam is addicted to opium, and he has been for a while. He thinks he's keeping this kind of quiet and nobody really knows what's happening. However, uh, at one time, he is at the beginning of the of the book. He's on the nod. He's sleeping in this opium den and gets rousted by one of the women that works there to tell him that they're being raided. He obviously cannot be found there. Uh, it would jeopardize his position. So he finds a, a way up through some crawl spaces to the attic and onto the roof. As he's in the attic and kind of popping up the door. Uh, there is a freshly dead body there, a uh, Chinese man, uh, with a knife stuck in him. Uh, Sam it recognizes the man is dead. There's no reviving him. For some reason, though, he grabs the knife and takes it with him. He hides out in a hiding spot while they're searching and, and the raid is, is taking place. And very early in the early morning hours, he kind of sneaks out and deposits the knife into the river. Uh, then he starts to question his own memory. Was, was it really a murder? Was that a body? Why does he have that? Why did he do those things? And his mind starts to play tricks on him. And that begins the murder mystery that will kind of take us through this entire book. 
Uh, I like the book. It, it did get a little action adventure near the end uh, with the prince and, and some, some scenes that happened there. Uh, but overall, I, I still really enjoy this and look forward to moving on to the fourth of this series. Moving on to the next one, I did an audio version of this. This is An Expert in Murder by Nicola Upson. So this is a perfectly fine murder mystery. I think I would have liked it more were it not for the central tenant of this series, which is Josephine Tay. This is a Josephine Tay mystery number one. Uh, now, Josephine Tay, for those of you who may not know, is an actual mystery writer. Along with Agatha Christie, she's part of this uh, golden age of mystery writers. And she also had a theater career and wrote screen, um, not screenplays, but actual play productions. And so while I liked the mystery itself, I just don't know why they needed to have Josephine Tay as the main character. It felt so strange to be reading uh, what I know to be a, a series that's going to happen that features a, a real life woman at the center. I don't know enough about Josephine Tay to know what is real, what what isn't, anything about her personality. So it's just, it makes me feel like I'm a little, being a little voyeuristic uh, when I don't really want to. I just want to read a good mystery. Uh, so that part kind of bothered me. And I would love to know if any of you have read this, what were your thoughts about using Josephine Tay as kind of this central character. And ironically, she doesn't even solve the mystery, which is even crazier here. Uh, we have the setup of a of Josephine Tay coming down from Edinburgh, Scotland to London because the stage play is on its last uh, hurrah and she's working on something new. And so she's coming down to uh, be with the cast and be there while they're doing the last uh, of the of the performances. Things I liked. Um, I liked the theater setting. Because it's the theater, uh, usually performing arts definitely attracts more of a bohemian type of artistic crowd, which includes often uh, people who are gay and bisexual. And so it felt authentic to, to have some of those storylines included. Uh, but at the same time, this is the interwar period uh, in London. It's also illegal and uh, puts you at a lot of risk to be, to be gay or to be known to be gay. Uh, so that, that was all handled very, very well. Some things that I, that, that I found challenging, there were a lot of characters here. There were a lot of characters and not always well defined. Now, as we know, in the first of any mystery series or any kind of series, you have to do a lot of context setting. And so introducing a lot of people, I get it, but there were still a lot of people in this one. Ultimately, I enjoyed it, except for that one nit that is so central to, to like why this whole thing exists in the first place. So I, I need to think a little bit more about if I want to continue this. Let me know if you read the Josephine Tay series by Nicole Epson and, and, and what do you think? I would, I would love to hear your opinions. Okay, so that was that. Uh, I had been meaning to read this for a while. And this is a book that I actually think the US cover was done better than the UK cover, which bummer because I went ahead and bought the UK one when it came out. This is Paul Mendez's uh, Rainbow Milk. This is a novel that is set in two different generations. Uh, and we skip a minute, we skip one. Uh, we start off with the Windrush generation and we meet a family that's come over from Jamaica and fallen on some very specific hard times. Uh, the father has lost his eyesight and we, the family has moved to the northern part of England and are really, really struggling. Uh, it does not meet the expectations that they, that they uh, thought when they left Jamaica and, and, and the racism is a, is a little more than they were expecting. It's not the, the, the shiny uh, beacon that they were hoping for. So after we, we meet that family, we jump ahead and we actually meet Jesse. And Jesse is, mo it's relatively modern day. Uh, it's the early 2000s. 
And Jesse is a teenager living in, in the same kind of north of England in the, the black country. Uh, so kind of industrial part of England. And he is a Jehovah's Witness. Now, Jesse also is gay and is really struggling with with feelings of his sexuality and his attraction. And interestingly enough, uh, they are part of the Jehovah's Witness uh, act, activity is that they go to homes and they preach at different people's homes and try to proselytize. And he, as he's knocking on a door, uh, a gentleman comes to the door and it's it's right after the, the first plane has hit September in September 11th in New York City. And everyone is so stunned in this home that, that he just walks in with them. And he realizes it's a gay man and his and his and his lover who live in this home. And so he's stunned by what's happening because it's a, a direct uh, indictment or challenge to all of the teachings of, of his religion that he's been raised in. Uh, but it's also to see two loving people who are tender and taking care of each other and living together, obviously as lovers and gay men, uh, was another shock to his system. So he had two massive jolts right there that really changed his trajectory. He ends up leaving uh, and moving to to London and getting involved in the sex trade uh, and meeting and meeting people that are just so varied and different from him. I really admired how overt uh, Paul Mendez is in his writing of uh, the culture of the sex trade in London at this time uh, about uh, disease, about AIDS, about uh, desire, uh, about uh, the actual acts of sex and and being a, a male prostitute at this time. Uh, I I think that the it was just matter of fact. It just is. It's part of the story. And I respected that a lot. I also respected the fact that the scope of the book and the timeline expands, expands after he's left the sex trade. So we don't have that typical narrative of, oh, someone was ruined and their life has gone, gone to hell because they were a sex worker. Uh, that's not always the case. There are many people who have just had that in their past, like you would have other t types of jobs. And I thought that was refreshing. This is, I do need to say, this is a debut novel. And it, in some parts, it really feels that way. It feels like, uh, in some cases, he wasn't sure he'd be able to get another one out. So he puts a lot into here. Uh, so keep that in mind if this is something you're interested in. That is maybe a weakness of the book. But overall, I enjoyed it and glad I read it for Pride. Okay, then I read one that was a complete shock at how much I disliked this book. Oh, so I'm doing a I'm doing a project, and this is with Elizabeth of Bookish North, where we are reading all of Virginia Woolf's fiction books uh, for the rest of the year. So we read her third book. This is Jacob's Room. Uh, now with this, we have Virginia really taking a leap a step function leap away from kind of traditional narrative into experimental. For me, that leap was a, 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 just too far. It, um, yeah. The challenges that I had was I never felt grounded in this book. I never felt like I understood perspective. Uh, I was lacking context. There were so many characters and we were kind of bouncing from one view to another to another and very little to no interiority. And so you were getting descriptions of things, but you weren't staying there long enough to really feel like you understood why. Why am I, why are we hearing about this character? Why are we learning about that, uh, you know, that part of the world? Ostensibly, it's the story of Jacob from youth through his, into his adulthood. And he is uh, a curious man. He's uh, intellectually interested in certain things and likes to travel and women just love him. Uh, I, I ended up having to stop reading it because I was so frustrated and moved to an audio version of it. 
uh, that helped a little bit because it read a little bit like a like little vignettes where you're observing uh, what's happening in this setting or in this little little section. So that was great. Uh, but it still didn't necessarily help me really like it that much more. It just helped me kind of get through it. So while this wasn't a hit for me, it does allow me to understand how she did the bridge from night and day uh, into Mrs. Dalloway. So you definitely, I definitely get to see what she's, the raw material she's trying to craft here. Uh, it just didn't work for me. So I would love to know your thoughts on Jacob's Room. If you read it, what your thoughts were. Uh, but I, and, I, and I will say the ending was a cracker. It was, a, it was a very powerful, really rich ending. So happy about that, at least. Then the last thing that I completed, this came from my library hold. This was uh, something that I, I also just really love this series. This is Sujata Macy's The Bombay Prince. This is number three from the Purvey Mystery series. Uh, this is fantastic. It's set in colonial India, but this time it's in Bombay, not in Calcutta. And ironically, I swear I did not plan this at all. It was just one of those uh, serendipitous uh, reading things. Uh, but pivotal to this story as well is that same trip by Prince Edward. And the issues of, of um, protest and how it's affecting, uh, this, in this case, the city of Bombay. So we have Praveen Mystery. Uh, she is a woman who was educated at Oxford and has studied law. She didn't get a, a degree because Oxford didn't give degrees to women because sexism. Uh, and so this was in the, in the 20s. Uh, she is not also not allowed to practice law. She's allowed to do contracts and she's allowed to support her father who owns a law firm in in um, Bombay, but she's not allowed to stand in front of a judge and practice law uh, in that sense. And it's something that's very, very frustrating to her. With this, in this story, she's at her office and she is visited by a young woman. And this woman is interested in some legal advice. She is a student at a school that her that uh, Perbeen's best friend, Alice, works at. Alice is an English woman and Alice teaches at this school. So the woman comes and wants to understand what would be the ramifications if she involves herself in a protest, uh, her, a protest against the fact that the entire school is being made to go uh, observe the passing of the, of the prince. And she believes in independence for India and wants to be part of the independence movement. But at the same time, she's also super uh, cognizant that her future depends on being able to graduate from this school. Praveen, you know, says, well, I'm not sure because of your, because of the code uh, and the ethics code of your school. So you should find that out. But, you know, you could always just claim to be sick that day and, and as a means of, 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 holding a protest, but not being overt. Well, this really uh, irks the sensibilities of our of the young woman because she's a Parsi and lying is against their ethics. And, and so Praveen feels very bad about uh, kind of the talking to she got, she got from this young woman uh, and, and it kind of sits with her. She ends up going to, to the school and wants to see what this young woman actually did uh, on the day that the prince is there and all sorts of chaos ensues. Uh, I will pause there because uh, I know there are a lot of people who probably want to read this as well, but I do find that between the two books, I appreciated more the direction that this one took, less of a action adventure or kind of you know, wild, wild pyrotechnics and more about kind of the backstory of the political machinations behind the scenes. Um, so I, I highly recommend if you'd like this type of, of historical fiction, this is a great series. And I thought this was a really great addition to, to the series itself. And I can't believe I have to wait now <laughs> so long for the next one. I do this all the time. I just read them when they come out and then I'm, I'm bereft. 
So that's what I read. A uh, pretty good, pretty good uh, showing right there. Now about what I'm currently reading. Where is it? Still with the Proust reading in Search of Lost Time, Volume 3, The Gramontes Way. I do need to make this go a little faster. So I, I'm going to try to put more time here. I know I said that last week. Um, next up, I did not make any further progress with The Women I Think About at Night, Traveling the Paths of My Heroes by Mia Kamki Maki. Uh, translated by Douglas Robinson. Uh, the next phase is the artist. I think I'm going to try to read uh, some of this this week uh, because I'm I'm really interested in that portion. Uh, she kind of lost me a little bit with the last section, which was the explorers. Uh, it was good, and I loved reading about some of the women, uh, but she was kind of interjecting herself a little a little too much. But hopefully, we can get back on track with the next section of artists. Then continuing with my Virginia Woolf series with Elizabeth from Bookish North, uh, Mrs. Dalloway. So I started this. We had our first check-in. Oh, I, 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 I say to myself, I don't know why I waited so long. I do know why I waited so long. I didn't feel that I had the life experience enough to really uh, give this book what it deserved. And I was right. Uh so the fact that I know and love London so much now that I can open it up and see a map and I have places that I love and I understand the neighborhoods uh, has definitely helped me as well as just being an older woman. Uh, some of the things that they're talking about that Clarice Dalloway speaks about in terms of regret and in terms of uh relationships and the tenuousness of how relationships change over the years and what we expect from people and what we're willing to give uh, is, is poignant now because of how old uh, my age and my experience. So I'm glad I waited and it is, uh, it's everything that everyone said. Uh, we are, I'm only on the first fourth of it and eating it like candy. I barely took any notes because I, you're just the flow of her writing it is sublime. It's unparalleled. Masterful, masterful work. So, so happy to be reading this with Elizabeth. Uh, then uh, reading, you know, we'll see how this one goes. So this is my Anita Bruckner project with Leo of A Little Book Life. Number 13, A Family Romance. It says here, Nearly Perfect by uh, Frank Kermode of The Spectator. I don't know who you are, Frank, but We'll, we'll see because Anita has been driving me absolutely insane lately with, uh, her, with just the same tropes and same, same dramas. So I'm hoping that a change from a singular character into a family story works well. I have enjoyed when she's done that in the past, so we'll see. But we're going to be reading that this, this week. So that's what I'm reading. I did want to add a little addendum. <laughs> so I talked about, in a previous video, I talked about epigraphs, introductions, footnotes, all of those types of things. And in my last video, I said that I wanted to go back and really look at some of the books that I loved and go back and read the introductions uh, because I thought that would be, I, I was safe then, right? I'd already finished the book. Well, no, uh, apparently I wasn't safe because I went back and read the introduction to Voices in the Evening by Natalia Ginsberg. This just came out, gorgeous, gorgeous cover. This came out from New Directions. And Colin Tobin did the, the introduction. In the introduction, he just spoiled two additional books. So I had to stop reading it. I, uh, how could you have expected that? I, I, so, so irritated. So now I'm really wary of that. Uh, then I have, uh, this is for my mood reading roulette, what I might read next week, uh, depending on my mood, or I guess this week. First up, I, I didn't, I haven't even finished Book Spin Book One. Book Spin is something that Rick McDonnell does, and it, it's really interesting. He says, pick 20 books, talk about them, or do, a, do put it on your Instagram. And then he'll number them from one to 20. He'll do a spin uh, and whatever number comes up, you read that for the next two months. Great premise, really fun. Uh, so I did it for the first one and 
I never fin- I never read the book, <laughs> but I have to, I actually have to read the book as part of the book two prize. So that will get done. I felt so bad about not reading the book. I didn't participate in, in book spin two, but I came back for book spin three. And in that, uh, he picked two books. He, he spun it twice. So the first one is Farewell Ghosts. Uh, this is by Nadia Terranova. And it's translated by Anne Goldstein. Anne Goldstein, who is famous for translating the Neapolitan series by Elena Ferranti. So excited by this. And I'm dreaming of Italy. So this is going to be perfect. And then I've never read oh, this author. This is Elizabeth Taylor. This is in the summer season. Feels apropos. This was first published in 1961. So really excited to read that. Hopefully I'll be able to do that this week. Uh, and in fact, I have the full week off, but my mother is coming to town, so I may not be able to do another video, uh, hence why this one is so long. So we'll see if I'm able to get something done uh, this week. But, you know, when she's here, I don't want us to have to have her here sitting watching me do this. It's so ridiculous. So we'll see. Uh, and then it's Jane Austen, July. So I have two things that I would like to maybe get to. The first is the annotated Northanger Abbey. I, you know, if I, I told you I love footnotes, but if I love footnotes, man, do I go bonkers for an annotated? Come on, that's like, it's like heaven. So I'm going to try to read some of this, if not finish it. And then I found this, this was one of my first finds post, uh, when, when we opened back up here in the Bay Area after COVID lockdown for a year. Uh, Jane Austen's Letters by the Folio Society edition. Uh, so I think I'm going to try to g get into this and see how this is. Uh, I hear she's very, very funny and it's got really great pictures. Uh, and yeah, so I'm looking forward to maybe reading some of this for Jane Austen July. I, don't, I guarantee I'm not going to finish it. Uh, let's just let's just say that one for the record. But it might be a nice thing to dip in, in and out of. So that is it. Thank you so much for watching this much longer video. Apologies. And I would love to know, have you read any of the books that I talked about? And what are your thoughts? I hope you're having a great summer so far. As always, we are still in a global pandemic. Please make sure to maintain so safe social distance. Wear a mask. I think we're with the variants coming out, it might still be important, even if you are vaccinated. Uh, wash your hands frequently and don't touch your face. That's it. I'll talk to you later. Bye.